Yeah, it'll be like four minutes from now. Mm-hmm. I broke it. <laughs> <laughs> the place is actually like walked into furniture. Is that right? Oh, yeah. yeah. That's like the worst. Like you just get yeah. your water on the house and just like just totally. Like just yep. And I did it, and I broke it in two places, and it's so light. So they're kind of like crunching on each other. Yeah. You know what? It could be worse. Test one, two, three, test one, two, three. Okay, 
So uh, I think we're going to get going. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be doing the kickball change with my broken foot. But um, yeah, we're going we're gonna to get going with this. Thank you, everyone, for joining in person. And thank you to the thousands of people who are joining us on live stream. I'm Tara Palmieri. I am an author at Puck, and I am um, so thankful to be here um, and to lead you along on this important discussion about a serious crisis in our country right now. It's possibly one of the most pressing health issues that we're facing, especially for our youth. Um, and for more than two generations, the National Crime Prevention Council and McGruff, the crime dog, where is he right now? Um, <laughs> he's, on, he's on break, he's on cigarette break, I'm kidding. <laughs> have been working to stem the ravages of drugs in our country. The fentanyl crisis is one of the most difficult drug challenges the US has faced. And business as usual will not work. We've seen that. And that's why the summit is here, bringing together government officials and families, community leaders, and others to develop new solutions. We thank the NCPC for calling us together today. And I'd like to recognize some of the organization board members who are with us today and ask them to stand. Uh, Brian Monks, he's the national chair and has championed the organization taking on this issue. And thank you, Brian. And Doug Beaver, who is with him. Uh, we thank you for all that you do. The important thing to remember is that this summit is not the end. It is just the beginning. And the hope is that more advocacy more action, more solutions will be developed. And we've got a lot to cover today, so let's start. First and foremost, I'll be introducing Paul Del Ponte, who is the executive director of the National Crime Prevention Council. And many of you know Paul, he's a very accomplished nonprofit executive, an award-winning communicator, and a consumer advocate. And as, a, as executive director of NCPC, his work has been focused on expanding their impact and introducing McGruff the crime dog to a new digital savvy generation of Americans. Um, and over his decade long career, he has guided a range of nonprofits, foundations and corporations to reach broader audiences through digital outreach and other types of communication, um, including the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. He positioned the Kellogg Foundation's largest domestic initiative to make pivotal healthcare policy changes and launched the National Academy of Medicine's landmark work on medical errors. And one of his major accomplishments was leading a coalition to promote greater civic engagement, boost public education on how forests help protect the environment. He's coordinated campaigns on mental health parity, dietary supplements, child nutrition, and has helped to increase the NIH's funding. And so I'm gonna uh, bring Paul up here who will take it away. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you all for joining us here, and I thank everyone joining us on the live stream, especially the family members and other loved ones of someone who's lost to fentanyl. Um, I thank you for your time, and most of all, I thank you for your energy. That's really what this issue needs. I'm going to start by taking us back to the early days of the AIDS pandemic with a quote. We're all going crazy living this epidemic every minute while the rest of the world goes on out there, all around us, as if nothing is happening, going on with their own lives, not knowing what it's like, what we're going through. We're living through war, but where they're living, it's peacetime, and we're all in the same country. Those words from ACT UP founder Larry Kramer were indeed from a different time. People were stigmatized for having a disease. Silence equaled death. It was accepted. Then courageous people showed up and said enough. Today's fentanyl crisis is different in some ways, but is much the same at its roots. There is unawareness, there is stigma, there is anger, 
Most dangerously, there is acceptance. There is silence. There is death. And we're here to say enough is enough. Addiction has always been with us. Drug overdose is common. It's so complex. It's easy to move on without acting. There's so much going on, people forget. They don't see what's right in front of them. It's easy to say it's someone else. Turn your head. A parent thinks, not my child. A principal thinks, not at my school. Until it happens in your family, in your community, and in your home. This tacit acceptance is unacceptable. There is no easy answer. Anyone who tells you otherwise is kidding you and themselves. There are plenty of sound bites, but we need action. Our nation must pledge to find the answers, and that's why we're here today. The good news is our starting point is a bit higher than in the early days of the AIDS pandemic. In this room are government leaders who are already acting. For that, they have our, have our thanks and are urging to move them on. Bringing them together with community leaders and parents today is part of the solution. It will help orchestrate a concert to replace today's cacophony of noise. Other missing pieces exist, but they need to be stitched together to create a stronger fabric to support change. Other pieces, like the development of more effective non-prescription pain relievers, are yet to be invented. New strategies are needed. When I speak to parents who've lost a child, I hear two things. First, I hear a strong resolve. Think about that for a minute. They've just lived through the most tragic experience any parent could imagine. And yet there's determination. They've turned their own sleepless nights into helping others. They face critics who say they're too angry. To those critics, I say, good. The nation needs a loud wake-up call. As Larry Kramer taught the world back in the 80s and 90s, people who simply go along with the unacceptable seldom make history. The other thing I hear is a cry for help. It's a selfless act to help others escape the, a tragedy they know all too well. They're helping us thread the needle towards stitching a stronger fabric of life. Our obligation is to help them sew. For every family member and friend of someone who was lost from fentanyl, I want to let you know that McGruff the Crime Dog and NCPC have your backs. After all, in the whole history of things, no one has probably had a bigger thing than McGruff keeping kids safe from drugs. Fentanyl was a 20th, 20th century creation that is now being illegally manufactured and distributed through a sophisticated 21st century supply chain. To control it, new policies are needed that weave together ways to combat the supply, demand, and use. Drug cartels are capitalists who break the law. What McGruff said from the very beginning is, all crime needs is a chance. Our nation is giving them too big a chance. Silence is giving this crime too big a chance. The Department of Homeland Security will tell us more about what is happening to keep this dangerous poison from entering our nation. Those new efforts are an important part of the solution. But for those who think this is just a border problem, I hold up the sweetener packet. If this was fentanyl, this would be enough to kill 500 people, probably as many people in this building. There is no border as large as ours with today's multi elements of international trade that could be that secure to keep two milligrams, the lethal dose, out of our country. We need to do more. The failure to adequately treat addiction needs to be addressed just as new approaches to criminal justice and drug enforcement are needed. The Drug Enforcement Administration has been quick to act 
and has not been shy on this issue. Everyone can benefit from learning more and doing more. The war on drugs made mistakes, mistakes that should not be repeated. But there is one thing that America should just say no to, and that is the sale of fake products and fake pills. For too long, the American public has turned a blind eye to the sale of fake products, and it's gotten us to the point where fentanyl is being sold to children on social media sites. These are the same companies that boast about the online communities they create. Sadly, some are not safe communities. Features like encrypted technology and disappearing text messages from drug dealers to teenagers have created an open-air drug market to sell fake pills that are often too lethal. Today it's fentanyl, tomorrow it could be something worse. No one is accusing these platforms of inviting in drug dealers. But those companies have an obligation to keep their platform safe and free from drug dealers. That's not too much to ask. And the National Crime Prevention Council and McGruff the Crime Dog invite each of those companies to the table to be part of the solution and turn those social media platforms into safe communities that we can all be proud of. Let's be clear, those who suffer from addiction deserve treatment and care. Those who traffic in the manufacture, sale, and distribution of fake pills with fentanyl are murderers and deserve to go to jail for a very long time. You will hear from Deputy Undersecretary Brent about our new efforts to involve McGruff the crime dog in changing the buying habits of a new generation to make fake products unacceptable. NCPC is proud to be part of this innovative partnership, and we look forward to hearing more. Just like with AIDS, there are those who will want to play a numbers game to get into arguments about how many people died from fentanyl poisoning. But that's something for statisticians, not leaders. Our call to action today pays direct homage to something that helped humanize AIDS. Each life lost to fentanyl is part of the fabric that is the story of our lives as a nation. Our response tells a hopeful story of who these United States are and will continue to be. Today, McGruff the Crime Dog, as the symbol of security for generations, announces the Lives Project, Fentanyl Digital Remembrance Quilt. It is the story of these lives that will motivate our call to action. In a couple minutes, you'll see the first patches of that quilt. Overnight, it will grow. In the coming weeks, it will grow larger and larger. Sadly, too large. That's the reality of what's happening in our country today. And I say our country because this is largely an American problem, one that we can fix. It is digital so that everyone can be part of it, so that everyone sees the scope of this 21st century problem and realized it is fueled in part by drug dealers using 21st century technology. We are honored to have with us some of the true heroes and voices that will help move us along. So I invite McGruff, Ava Michelle, and her mom, Jeanette, to join me And we thank them for traveling from California to be part of us here today. Sadly, their brother Devin was lost to fentanyl just months ago. And they have the courage to use their voices, their social impact, to help motivate others for change. And we are very proud to have them join us. Please, I will ask. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm a hugger, so I'm a Oh, that's hugger. okay. McGruff? Thank you so much, McGruff. <laughs>
I'm going to add on real quick. If there are any critics in here, bring it on. We were on Dance Moms. We can <laughs> okay, handle nice. oh God, anything. So, um, Yeah, so I just, first of all, hi, I'm Ava. This is my mom, Jeanette. Um, I am very nervous. <laughs> um, but I, first of all, just want to say thank you so much for having us here. It's an honor to be able to speak here. Um, but honestly, it's more so an honor to be a part of something that is trying to do good on an issue that we have seen not much being done. And at this point, it's it's too late. So many people have already been lost. So uh, thank you for having us here. I agree with that. Thank you for having us. But I know that I could be doing something else right now with my time. I don't want to be here. I would rather be yelling at my son, you know, to clean the dishes out of the <laughs> kitchen sink. Much rather I would give that moment for anything. So, and I'm sure all of you could find something better to do on a beautiful Wednesday. So I am thankful to be here. I'm here because of my son and um, because of her and to help other families not go through what we've had. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so our story, uh, we are here because a year and a half ago, I had absolutely no idea what fentanyl was when my, uh, do we need, I am tall, so I might need to squat. <laughs> do you want um, to just lean in? We'll lean in. <laughs> do you want to oh yes, I would love that. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that's so much better. I'll, I'll talk here. Um, so I had absolutely no idea what fentanyl was when my brother, uh, 23 years old, and I was 18, uh, he passed away from fentanyl poisoning. Uh, that was the worst day of my life. My brother has always been my best friend. Um, and losing him. Let me try taking it for a minute. Sorry. I got this. <laughs> uh, is unfair. Um, it's, it's crazy because the night before he passed, I think it was probably one of, shit, sorry. <laughs> one of the best nights that I've ever had with my brother. Um, we were talking about this business that we wanted to start together. And the last thing that we said to each other was we were so excited to uh, wear the clothes that we were going to make because we were going to look so cool together. And um, we were going to match and it was going to be very cool. Um, and then I, for some reason, felt like I needed to get up really early in the morning. And I... Sorry, I didn't know I was going to get this emotional, but it just happens. Um, I walked out into the living room and found my brother dead. I was fine up until that. Um, yes, that morning was and still is the worst day of our lives. Um, I just, um, I can, I, can, I remember the morning, but then there's so many things I don't remember. The one thing that I do remember, and I say this not to, oh, I do say this to scare people a little bit. I do. Parents, especially, so parents are watching. Um, not only losing my son is so hard, but watching the pain of your other child and that there's nothing you can do. And just not wanting anyone else to go through that. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what happened after. Um, obviously she found him and that scream will live with me forever. It's that bad. My son was 6'5", 235 pounds of solid muscle. He worked out once to twice a day. He ate me out of house and home, and I'm talking good stuff. I he tuna, I need more protein, I need to gain weight, I need to, he was the healthiest and so prideful of it. Um, he would be the one that, during the pandemic, he couldn't get to the gym, would walk outside, shirtless, of course, 
and do jump rope and run down the street and just keep active. So this can happen to anyone. Um, he took one pill to fall asleep, one Percocet to fall asleep, what he thought was Percocet, and it took him out. And you know when the EMS, EMS came to my door and saw him on my couch in my living room, he said, it's fentanyl. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, I can tell you right now that the autopsy is going to come back. It's fentanyl. What it does to someone, they have seen it so many times that they, he, they knew. They knew with him sitting just a couple feet away from him. At that point, um, I was also asked if I found any pills to let them know. Obviously, in the moment, I wasn't searching for anything. And um, I did search for pills eventually, and I did find some. And I called our local police department, the cards they gave me. They did come out and get the pills since that day, and I handed those pills over, and I got the receipt for that they took them. I've never once heard anything else from them, not what they were. I told them I have the messages from the dealer on his phone, not a word. And I'm curious why, if I've got that information, and that dealer has dealt to someone else and killed someone else's family, why we couldn't have prevented that? Why are we still not doing anything about following through when we have concrete information? I'm not making up a name. I can't go to it. Trust me, as a parent, could you imagine your, your child passing away and knowing who did it and not being able to do anything about it? Trust me, I've had thoughts. I've had thoughts of walking into that person on the middle of the street. I've, what would it do? I live with my daughter alone in California. I'm not going to bring that on us. So I'm looking to law enforcement, political, everything, anyone that can do anything to stop this needs to, needs to do something. Because I can't do it by myself, and she can't do it by herself. She can't do it by herself, and all the other family members can't. Trust me, we're going through enough trying to get through everyday things. So... She lives with seeing her brother every morning. She, that's embedded in her head. I do. I remember the scream in her voice. I have to live with that for the rest of my life. Let's stop other families having to remember those things. Sorry, I probably went on. <laughs> it's OK. Um, and I think now that I've gathered myself, thank you. Um, I think the thing that makes me angry is the fact that I had no idea what it was. And the police who came in knew exactly what it was, which means that they have seen this enough and they have not been speaking out about it. I'm on social media all the time. I'm Gen Z. I'm on social media all the time. I did not see one thing about it. Most kids my age have absolutely no idea what fentanyl is. And let's be real, this is the number one cause of death in the US for people from 18 to 45, but we're not counting the minors. There are, there are so many kids that are dying from this, and this is not okay. I posted a TikTok video a few uh, weeks ago talking about this because I got so angry that I kept seeing middle schoolers dying from this on the news. And it is over 12 million views, which is, I am so grateful for, and I'm so grateful that I can spend that, spread that message. But the comments are filled with people who are saying that this is the first time that they are hearing about this, that they didn't know this, that they don't know these facts. And those are people that if I didn't post this video, they could have passed away. They could have lost a friend. They could have lost a family member, and that is not okay. I should not be the one who has to go through this and put myself through this every single time to get that message out. People need to care. And uh, I, I, like I said, I'm, I'm so grateful that we're here. But at the end of the day, it's too late to be here already. We've already lost so, 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 so many people. So I look to everyone in this room. I look to everyone who is not in this room, who should be in this room. We need action. We need to spread awareness. We need the, the right, correct facts, because there's so much misinformation out there that makes my words not carry the weight it should because people need to start listening so um honestly i just um i really hope that that this sparks some action because there hasn't been enough action on this issue 
Um, but something that my mom and I are doing that we're very passionate about is that we have actually started the Devin Michael Foundation, which is a foundation that we are trying to spread awareness about fentanyl, about mental health, because a lot of the times it is it all stems from mental health or it stems from um, self-medicating. Self Thank you. Um, and we're also helping to support individuals through their addiction mental health journey because we want to support those individuals that are struggling like Devin was struggling. Um, also, <laughs> that clothing line that I talked about in the beginning, my mom and I started it, and it is called Identified. Uh, and we're really, really, really proud of that because it, it has so much of Devin in it. And uh, a portion of the proceeds go to the foundation that we created, which is the Devin Michael Foundation. So. Uh, we're, we're doing what we can to, to make good out of what we've been through and trying to use our voices in the best way, but still wish we didn't have to, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, to add in uh, a little bit to the identified, um, that night before, um, I, the kids were at the house together, and when I walked in the house from a not-so-good date, um, I walked in and these two were going crazy and talking and you know, and Devin had named the clothing line that night. And he named it Identified. And I know that I've heard multiple times people talk about the stereotypical, the, the, stigma. the stigma that gets put on, um, the assumption of your child was 22 and passed away. Oh, it must have been a drug overdose. I have so many people that don't even ask. Like, really? But his whole view on it at 23 years old was, we go through this life and we want to all be created equal, but yet we, set, we separate ourselves into gay, straight, whatever it is, we separate ourselves, which is all beautiful. And at the end of the day, we are all humans going through this thing called life. Let's stop identifying like, oh, you had a past drug use. Oh, you had jail time, but let's look at what we are now. Let's look at where we've come. What's the saying? It's not how hard you fall, it's how quick you get back up. That's what we need to focus on instead of all of the that you did this and you did that because he went through a hard life he did we went through a lot of things but i'll tell you what that made me so proud of him on where he was he was in the best spot possible and i'm sure many people that go through kids with some type of addiction or whatever you wonder why at the good time why at the good time were they taken from us it's because we have those good memories if they were taken from us in the bad part we would have, it would have been not a good memory, not a good way for her to lose her brother. Her and her brother were best friends. Devin and I, he looked at me and he said, I swear to you, mom, I will be there forever for you. And I still hold him to that. Still, I will hold him to that. So that's where Identified came from. And it came from a 23-year-old boy that had lived life to his fullest. And with that being said, moving into this amazing quilt, um, Remembrance, I'm not going to turn around and look at the picture because there's nothing harder to look at than your son's picture, or your child's picture with an ending date on it. So. Yeah, so just closing, I just want to say thank you so much for creating something that's so beautiful but also humanizes one of the worst things that is going on in our country right now. So let's take a moment to look at these people who've lost their lives to fentanyl poisoning uh, when, they, when they didn't mean to, when they didn't ask for it. Um, they were poisoned. So thank you. That's yeah. okay. Are we okay?
Thank you so much for those powerful words in your testimony. I know how difficult that is, but it means a lot to us that you could share that. Um, so our first panel is comprised of leaders from three governmental agencies that are key to developing solutions to the crisis. This is the first time that they're sharing the stage together, and we hope it's not the last. They've been invited to speak because to some extent they are the first responders to tackling the problem. After I introduce the panel, I will invite each of you to tell us something different that the agency is doing that your agency is doing to address the fentanyl crisis. Derek Brent is Under Secretary of Commerce for Intellectual, Intellectual Property and Deputy Director of the United States Patent and Trademark Office. He serves as the principal advisor to Kathy Vidal, Under Secretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and Director of USPTO, managing a wide portfolio of programs and operations for one of the largest intellectual property offices in the world with more than 13,000 employees and an annual budget of more than $4 billion. His responsibilities include working with Director Vital to lead the USPTO, advance IP policy and procedures for the benefit of the country, expand the USPTO's outreach efforts to incentivize and support more innovation and entrepreneurship nationwide, and execute the agency's policies, priorities, and programs. John Delena is the Senior Executive Service Associate Special Agent in charge of the Drug Enforcement Administration. Um, he is a member of the Department of Justice Senior Executive Service and previously served as the Deputy Special Agent in charge of the Drug Enforcement Administration's New England Field Division, where he had oversight of DEA operations in Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, Maine, and Vermont. It's his 30th year of law enforcement 26 have been spent with the DEA. And we have Christopher Heck, who is the Acting Deputy Assistant Director of Public Safety and Border Security at the Homeland Security Investigations. Um, he oversees a wide variety of investigative and special operations programs at the national level, targeting transnational criminal organizations involving human smuggling, narcotics trafficking, racketeering and violent gang activity and other crimes enforced by HSI, the Homeland Security Investigations. These pro programmatic, these programmatic, excuse me, areas support the targeting of cross-border criminal organizations that exploit America's legitimate trade, travel, and financial systems for illicit purposes. Thank you all for joining. I will hand it over to you. Um, and after, we'll take questions from reporters. Yeah. Okay. First of all, before I start, um, Ava and Jeanette and, and Amy, thank you. Very brave to, to get up there and say those words, and uh, certainly meaningful to me. And I know everybody watching as well, so thank you. Good morning again. I am so incredibly grateful to the National Crime Prevention, Prevention Council for hosting today's summit. Fentanyl is a topic that needs to be discussed not only here, but also in our homes and throughout all of our communities. In my 26 and a half years as a DEA special agent, I have never encountered a drug threat as dangerous and concerning as fentanyl. Our work in this area has never been more vital or more urgent than it is right now. We are facing a threat that we have never seen before, with Americans dying at unprecedented rates. 107,622 Americans died last year alone. 66% of those involve synthetic opioids like fentanyl. All of us across the country are seeing unspeakable tragedies like this, happening again and again, every single day, in our communities where we live and work. From DEA's perspective, several factors have contributed to this current epidemic. The sheer lethality of fentanyl, just a small amount, the equivalent of 10 to 15 grains of salt, can be deadly. 
Illegally manufacturing fentanyl is not an exact science. Chemicals are combined with other binding agents in a vat, mixed up, and then pressed into pills or powder. And there is no telling how much fentanyl ends up in each pill or substance. These illegal drug labs can essentially run 24 hours a day, contributing to an endless supply of synthetic opioids. Fentanyl is made from chemicals primarily sourced in China and synthesized in Mexican cartel drug labs. This is different from plant-based drugs like cocaine and heroin that relied on crops, manpower, and the environment to harvest. Moving to chemical-based drugs also means there is no limit to how much these cartels can produce. Another contributing factor, the use of online and social media platforms to advertise and sell drugs. This has made fentanyl too easily accessible. When I first began my career, drug deals required a face-to-face -face meet. That is no longer always the case. Drug transactions can happen every day on social media behind a cloud of anonymity and disappearing information. Cash apps are used for payment. The drugs are then simply delivered to your location. Today, anyone on social media might see an advertisement for drugs pop up on their feed or on a friend's story. Americans as young as 12 have been poisoned by fentanyl. I have a son about that age. We talk about the dangers of fentanyl all the time. He may be sick of hearing about that, but I will never stop having that conversation with him. And that conversation is equally important to my older children. The thought of unsuspecting people being poisoned by fentanyl <clears throat> is what keeps me up at night and what has all of us asking what more we can do to save lives and how we can meet this moment. Our education and outreach efforts have never been more important. We must arm our young people with all of these critical facts so they can make healthy and empowered decisions. You may have heard about DEA's One Pill Can Kill campaign. We launched this effort last fall. One Pill Can Kill is an awareness campaign to sound the alarm in communities about the danger and prevalence of fake pills. Fake pills that look le le exactly like legitimate prescriptions, but are actually fentanyl. We've also conducted a series of enforcement activities around that campaign. Our goal is to educate communities about the dangers of fake pills while targeting fentanyl in those enforcement efforts. Last year alone, DEA seized more than 440 million lethal doses of fentanyl, enough to supply every American. Make no mistake, fentanyl being pressed into pills has played a major role in today's poisoning epidemic. And the two cartels primarily responsible for this are the Sinaloa Cartel and the Jalisco Cartel, or CJNG. DEA's core operational priority is to disrupt the illegal supply chain by taking a network approach in targeting Sinaloa and CJNG in their entirety. We are relentlessly focused on saving American lives and defeating these two cartels. The reason these cartels are flooding fentanyl into our communities is simple, to make money. They can make a fake Oxycontin pill containing fentanyl in Mexico for about 15 cents and sell that same pill throughout our entire country from anywhere from 10 to $30. The fentanyl coming into our communities is the deadliest drug that has ever been widely available in this country. It's highly addictive, 50 times more potent than heroin. And the question I get often asked is, why would anybody sell a substance that is ultimately killing off their customer base? And the answer is this, the cartels are trying to drive addiction in America. If a user takes fentanyl and lives, they're likely on a path to addiction, which means they come back and buy more. If a user takes fentanyl and dies, they just don't care because there's millions of people behind that. And these cartels see over 100 million other potential buyers on social media apps that they can target next. We must come together in this race to save lives. We can protect the people we love by having age-appropriate conversations. We all have 107,622 reasons to have those conversations today. You must understand 
that there are no legitimate pharmaceutical pills being sold on social media. And you must know that taking a pill that wasn't prescribed to you and film, filled at a pharmacy can potentially be deadly. In June, DEA proudly hosted a family, family members at DEA headquarters who have tragically lost their cho children to this crisis. We know that together we are stronger. And as a result of that movement, we created our Faces of Fentanyl exhibit. It's a memorial in our lobby where we display photos of lives that have been lost to the drug poisoning epidemic. What began with just a couple hundred photos now has over 4,000. The youngest person memorialized on that wall is 17 months. The oldest is 70. This drug does not discriminate. This is our call to action. It is why we do what we do. And if you remember just one thing today, drug cartels are engaging in deliberate, calculated treachery. They are killing Americans. The deliberate, calculated tre treachery of mixing fentanyl into a fake pill, into heroin, into cocaine, into methamphetamine. We have lost too many of our friends and family. We all play a vital role. And as I said before, our work around this issue has never been more urgent or more essential than it is right now. Thank you for having me here today. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, Chris Heck with uh, Homeland Security Investigations. Uh, for those that you, uh, let me first off by start by saying thank you to Paul uh, for the invitation for Homeland Security Investigations to to show our support here and to discuss this uh, this epidemic. Uh, the board directors as well, thank you for the invitation. Ava, Jeanette, your mom, the, the activists here, thank you so much for your participation. As uh, I told Paul earlier, uh, it's an all hands on deck approach. Uh, we need everybody involved in this fight. And uh, so thank you for telling your story. Uh, for those that don't know, Homeland Security Investigations is the principal investigative arm of Homeland Security. Uh, we are responsible for disrupting, dismantling transnational organized crime organizations uh, that are flooding the United States with fentanyl and other illegal drugs, fueling the overdose uh, epidemic. To this, uh, HSI conducts federal criminal investigations at every location in the illicit drug supply chain internationally, where TCOs operate and manufacture illegal drugs at our nation's port physical border where, sm where smugglers attempt to exploit America's legitimate trade, travel, and transportation systems. In our communities where criminal organizations can earn substantial profits from selling poison and on the dark net. Wanted to take you sort of through our approach to how we uh, are fighting this uh, fentanyl epidemic. Uh, at HSI, we sort of uh, have a four-pronged uh, approach. Uh, we like to pull say that we push our physical borders out and we have a robust international footprint. Uh, we have 93 offices located in 56 countries where hundreds of our special agents work with foreign host governments uh, to prioritize in investigations and intelligence uh, to really attack the transnational organized crimes uh, at the manufacturing level. Uh, this is mostly seen in the Asia Pacific region where HSI to date in FY22 uh, has seized 800 800,000 pounds of precursor chemicals. Um, so our objective is to stop the supply before it even arrives in Mexico. Our transnational criminal investigative unit in Mexico uh, is working hard with their collaborative partners there in country. Uh, if precursors make it to Mexico to uh, uh, go after the labs there where fentanyl is made. Uh, once uh, fentanyl reaches the border, we are working robustly with our uh, parent agency, U.S. Customs and Border Protection at the ports of entry uh, to robustly investigate, interdict, and, uh, and seize fentanyl there through our 84 uh, Border Enforcement Security Task Force offices, uh, task forces. And lastly, uh, domestically, uh, we work with our partners at DEA on the OCDEF strike forces, 11 of those domestically, and uh, we look forward to continuing uh, our collaborative efforts in the, uh, in the fight against uh, fentanyl smuggling. Thank you. Can you hear me? There we go. There we go. <clears throat> First, I want to open by saying thank you, Paul, for your inspiring words and your hard work. I want to thank you to the, uh, the board uh, for the invitation to be here, but also for your hard work in this area. Um, and Tara, thank you very much for moderating, uh, moderating us. Um, I want to say a special note 
uh, to Ava, to Amy, to uh, Jeanette. Um, thank you for your work in this area. Um, one of my favorite quotes, I probably say it too often, but, but I'm going to say it again because it means, it means so much to me, but it also means a lot here. And Jackie Robinson once said that one of the measures of our lives is in the impact that it has on others. Thank you for taking yours and sharing it and also sharing your hard work and dedication. Uh, others will be impacted and they, the world will be better for your efforts. So thank you. So the US, USPTO, one of our work, our area of work primarily in this area is, um, is, in the, is with collaborations. But we're handling, the, we're handling this issue of counterfeits from a demand side primarily. So we, we collaborate with Homeland Security to DEA, Custom, Customs and Borders. Oh, OK. Uh, uh, Homeland, we, we partner with Homeland Security, Customs and Border. Uh, we partner internationally uh, through our IP attaches. We uh, partner with our with uh, intellectual property and other trade uh, 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 colleagues in other parts of the world. And primarily what we're trying to do is drive down uh, the demand side. We're trying to drive down the consumer's desire and need for uh, or desire for uh, counterfeit products. And that is important. So for a couple of years now, we've a few years, uh, we've had a great partnership with the National Council. Uh, or the National Crime Prevention Council. Uh, and we've just kicked off, a, we kicked off a, a program called Go For Real. Uh, and it has been an incredible success. Uh, I, I, I was sworn in, in, in into my job in August. And I believe on my second day, I'm pretty sure, Paul, it was my, uh, it was my second day, uh, they grabbed me and said, come downstairs. Uh, uh, you have, we, have, we have a project to do. And the project was we were meeting with the National Council and we were doing, uh, a set of PSAs uh, centered around Go For Real. And they've been a success. They've been a great success. There's a YouTube channel. Uh, they've been expanded out, I believe, into other countries. Uh, and the reception has been incredible. So it means that we are actually reaching people. We are actually starting to, and as we reach people with this messaging, it will eventually, it will start to drive down the effect. Look, uh, and we have to keep doing it, but that's, it, this is only the beginning. I think someone said that uh, in the opening remarks. This is just the beginning. We, there's more to do. Collaborating with our, with our other agencies, uh, you know, identifying fake products, and you know, identifying fake products, uh, uh, you know, fake goods. It's, import, it's important, and, and why is it important? Because you know, it looks like it's just a, it's a game controller, or it may look like it's an airbag, and it's okay. And, but we want consumers to start to think about these things as dangerous. And that is that, and they are. They're very, very dangerous. Uh, the, the, you know, counterfeit airbags have led to, to injuries and significant deaths. Um, you know, and other products that are, that are knockoffs. And then when you get into the pharmaceutical world, well, it, it speaks for itself. It's absolutely horrible. So, Thanks to the partnerships that we have, it's going to take teamwork, uh, and it's not going to happen overnight. But I guarantee you, if if everybody working on this has the heart and the passion of the folks in this room, it's going to happen. So this question is for John. How does the DEA work with local police to tackle this issue? Need to hold this because I don't want to get yelled at again by the people <laughs> in the back. You know, I, I think the thing that I'm most proud of uh, that DEA does is partner with local law enforcement uh, throughout our community in our enforcement efforts, but but also now more than ever in our community engagement and outreach efforts. Um, you know, we know that you know enforcement alone isn't. Uh, what's going to tackle this, and that's why we're so engaged at so many levels, um, you know, in all of our communities. DEA has dedicated a community outreach specialist as part of Operation Engage, 
uh, in all of our field divisions. So we make sure that we're having those connections every day. In terms of, uh, of that enforcement, uh, the, the administrator of DEA has guided us into this network approach for those two cartels. We need all the information from local law enforcement to work together. We can't possibly connect all the dots until we collect all the dots. So every piece of every investigation uh, is what's critical to lead us to the next phase. Thank you. Um, I think we have some reporter questions. I'll, I will uh, pull them up right now. Oh. Yeah, is, are, uh, does anyone in the room, would they like to, yes, Gretchen? I'll start and then and my partners can jump in. Uh, you know, those. The question was, um, how, is, how are they following the money to make sure the money is not going to these cartels when they're selling? I think it's equally as important, you know, that we target the money that's being repatriated back to those cartels, which continues to fund their operations as it is, you know, the drugs that are coming in. We're equally focused uh, on that. And I'll, I'll turn it over to my yeah, partner here. Sure. Yeah, it's, uh, same. Thanks, John. Uh, same, same exact approach. We are we are robustly working with our federal, state and local law enforcement partners to go after the illicit proceeds of those transnational organized you know, transnational criminal organizations. Um, the days of um, seeing hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in a bag as proceeds are, are slowly slipping away. Uh, we are now moving our efforts into the cyber realm and cryptocurrency as uh, identifying uh, illicit proceeds going back, back to Mexico and overseas. So uh, we have learned that the organizations have changed uh, with the current environment, and uh, we are uh, looking at going after cryptocurrency as well uh, for those organizations. So um, here's a question from the Associated Press. The number of opi opioid abuser users in the U.S. isn't growing, but the overdose, overdose deaths are on the rise. What accounts for that? Are people turning to heroin instead of prescrip as, as prescribing titans? Is, there more strong, is the fentanyl stronger that's in supply, or is there more of it? I'll start, I guess, and, and I don't know the, the, the stat that's being quoted there, but I think the reason we are all here is this. We have never seen a, a more deadly substance than fentanyl. Just two milligrams is enough to kill somebody. I, I think, you know, that, you know, we continue to talk about that. These insidious cartels are hiding that fentanyl in every single thing that they possibly can, and their, uh, their approach is this, relentless expansion through addiction. We need to remember that. I was just going to ask another question about how does fentanyl cross the border? Does it usually come in pill or powder form? Sure, great question. Uh, so from Homeland Security investigation standpoint, we see fentanyl coming across the border in both uh, pill and powder form, um, concealed in any traditional method that you can imagine. Um, and I also want to mention, you know, the focus is on the southwest border all the time. However, uh, a lot of large amounts of fentanyl are also coming through our seaports. Uh, uh, airports, international airports, and international mail facilities. So uh, any way that you can imagine that fentanyl is being smuggled in various forms, uh, you name it, we've seen it. How do you detect it? I mean, do drug dogs, can they smell it? Or how do you, how do you see fentanyl? Sure. So uh, we work hand in hand with our sister agency, as I mentioned earlier, U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Uh, they have a robust presence uh, at ports of entry and between ports of entry. Uh, they have narcotics uh, detector dogs, um, NII equipment, non-intrusive inspection equipment there, x-ray uh, type uh, machinery uh, equipment that can also see through uh, legitimate trade, uh, try to identify uh, illegal shipments of narcotics. And also we use a lot of intelligence driven uh, uh, avenues uh, to uh, help uh, steer our investigations against these networks. Um, how has the market changed in the past few years? Uh, well, I guess I'll go, I'll go ahead and speak for this. Uh, we have seen an increase, a huge increase uh, in, in the fentanyl supply 
And uh, obviously, it's a, as I was telling Paul earlier, it's a basic economics course, uh, supply and demand. As, uh, as demand uh, increases, supply lowers, it gets more expensive. As you know, the, the, the commodity floods the market, uh, the prices decrease. Uh, but we are seeing uh, a lot more fentanyl on our streets. For example, 2018, uh, HSI seized about 6,000 pounds of fentanyl. And uh, we're on course right now in FY22, just ended. Uh, to seize over 20,000 pounds. So that's a, you know, triple what we saw in t just two or three years ago. Uh, so it is, uh, it is saturated in the market. And if, if I can add just one quick thing, and it's because it's something Chris and I were talking about a little bit beforehand. You also have the, with the growth of e-commerce, it's, it, it's now expanded as a di the distribution channel for it. And it, it's just amazing. Because it's, it's incredible how that is spread out. It's not just a marketing platform. It's a way that this product, the product is now moving through channels of commerce. So just pe so people are taking the fentanyl thinking that they're taking other drugs. Is that how it's, it's working? So they think they're taking a Percocet in this case, and it's actually a, a yeah. synthetic. Yeah, so, so for instance, uh, one of our office not too long ago uh, seized over 630,000 M30 pills, or what are, what are marked as M30 pills, it's, uh, counterfeit uh, oxycodone um, that, uh, you know, tested positive for, for fentanyl, right? So if that got out to the consumer uh, on the black market thinking that they were taking an oxycodone pill, it's actually fentanyl. Uh, it's a huge, huge problem uh, that we need uh, all hands on deck for to, to and help these, us out. These cartels are trying to target as many Americans as they can, and that's why now it's not just an M30. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a Xanax or an Adderall. Uh, are designed to look like a Xanax or Adderall. It's actually laced with fentanyl. An insidious move, again, on, on behalf of these cartels to try to target as many Americans as they possibly can. Just because it's cheaper to, to produce. The, the user doesn't know, in most of these cases, that it's fentanyl that they're consuming, and that's what we heard here today. It, it's a, you know, a user believes that they're, borrow, that they're getting uh, or buying uh, a Percocet, uh, an Adderall, uh, a Xanax from somebody, and they don't know that somebody along the supply chain made that pill and put fentanyl inside it. We're also seeing it in other drugs, as I mentioned. Somebody thinks that they might be taking cocaine or methamphetamine only to find out that somebody in that supply chain inserted fentanyl in there, and they're not prepared for that. Why would they want to insert the fentanyl? Because it's more addictive? It's, it's their plan for widespread addiction. They want to addict as many Americans as they can. By adding fentanyl, they believe that that person eventually be, will become addicted and need to come back to buy more. As I said earlier, if they end up killing people, and they killed 107,622 Americans last year, they're not moved by that. They won't change their business model. And I also want to go back momentarily for, from what the Deputy Undersecretary was stating earlier about the e-commerce platforms. Uh, the dark net, the e-commerce platforms, we're seeing a huge increase there as well. And uh, to go back to your question, ma'am, uh, earlier about cryptocurrency, um, that's sort of how we're trying to defeat that, that, uh, those platforms as well. Uh, can I, are there any questions in the room? Yes. Yeah, the, the, the worst part of it is they have no idea as they're mixing this how much of it ends up in a pill. And, and, and oftentimes we see people that maybe split a pill or share a pill, and maybe one person does suffer a drug poisoning and the other doesn't. And it has nothing to do with anything other than how much fentanyl ended up in each part of that pill. That's what makes it so dangerous. Thank you. all the money and to stop it when it gets here. But it's, it's, these labs, I've seen them, it's, it, it, it's mind-boggling. 
This is a question from a parent. How is fentanyl a bipartisan issue, and what are the dangers of allowing it to be politicized? I mean, I would, I mean, uh, well, go ahead, Paul. Yeah. Yeah, here. Take it away. I'm happy to take that one. Um, we're a few weeks away from an election. Rhetoric is overheated. Um, and so it's a very good question uh, because it needs to be a bipartisan issue. Um, if we go back and look at how things are solved, um, there was a view that AIDS was a partisan issue. In the end, it was the Bush administration that launched an international effort to combat AIDS. It needs to be bipartisan. Our hope is that after the election, the people who were screaming, just shut down the border, label fentanyl a weapon of mass destruction, those are all great sound bites. They might work in a campaign, but they don't work in the real world of developing solutions. We hope that after the election, both parties come together. We have an open door. Uh, we've always worked bipartisanly. And this is how we're going to solve the problem in a bipartisan way. Is there a role for the Department of Education? And how can your agencies coordinate with them to teach kids and people about this? Uh, you know, I'll say DEA is, is working with the Department of Education. And we've been working uh, diligently uh, throughout all of our communities to try to get this uh, this message out there wherever we can. Uh, it, it's not easy, and that's why so many of these parent groups, and I, and I see one of them here right now who I know has done a lot of that work, uh, ha they've dedicated themselves to try to not only share their own personal story, uh, but to connect to as many people in as many communities, young and old, as they possibly can. I think Ava had a question as well. Yes. I'll start. Uh, again, we've never seen a more deadly substance. Uh, I'm not a medical doctor, and I, and I um, you know, or do I work for EMS or a fire department? I think they're probably better suited to answer it. I know we take precautions in everything that we do whenever we're dealing with that substance because of how deadly it can be. Yeah, same, same answer as John. We, we have uh, detailed uh, precautions that we deal with uh, when we're doing enforcement operations for our own agents. Uh, as John mentioned, I'm not a doctor, EMS professional, but uh, yeah, I would, uh, we take huge precautions, especially when we're going to some of these mills. Uh, we just don't want our law enforcement professionals um, and any innocent bystanders uh, to get harmed by this. Just like having it in the air could almost, could harm you, to breathe it in. Yeah. Yeah. I, like I said, I don't know, I'm, a do I'm not a doctor, but, but we take uh, we use PPE uh, equipment when we go into these mm -hmm. locations. Uh, we have gloves on, uh, mm -hmm. sometimes respirators. Uh, yeah, so I, I guess it could be a possibility, although I'm not a doctor. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a very, very, very dangerous, very dangerous substance. And I mean, let me, legitimate fentanyl is used in hospitals, right? So um, it's, it's, it's a very, very, very dangerous substance. Right. How is the U.S. partnering with Mexico to stop the production of these fake pills? Yeah, as I mentioned earlier in, in, the, in my uh, opening statement, our transnational investigative uh, criminal unit down in Mexico works robustly with the Mexican officials down there, primarily law enforcement. Uh, if we are unsuccessful in identifying precursors before they arrive to Mexico, uh, we are working with them to identify labs down there and take those out of business, um, as well as working with our DEA counterparts uh, to identify, as someone in the audience said earlier, the pill presses um, down there uh, uh, used to manufacture uh, those pills uh, in Mexico. Uh, so we are, we are working with uh, Mexican officials on a daily basis. Um, and uh, and uh, we can't 
uh, arrest our way out of this problem. Uh, we can't work on this problem alone, and it really has to be a, a, a multi-country uh, solution here uh, to, uh, to really decrease the supply chain. And if I can add to that, in, you know, it's going to take teamwork. It's going to take a lot of teamwork. Uh, and at the USPTO, we've actually partnered with our colleagues, our counterparts, in the uh, in Mexico for intellectual property uh, to help our to, to help law enforcement with identification of various of various, uh, uh, of various uh, uh, drug matters. Uh, are there any other questions in the in the audience? We have a few questions from social media that I'll I'll get to. Um, how common is rainbow fentanyl, and should parents concerned about it be concerned about it during Halloween? So I'll take that. Um, We've now seized multicolored pills, rainbow fentanyl, uh, or multicolored powder, brightly colored pills and powder in 26 states with our, with our local law enforcement partners. Uh, it is a disturbing trend, but it just also goes to show how fluid these cartels are. They want to continue to, to manufacture things that might be attract, uh, attracted to more, to more indifferent users. Um, we have no direct information that Halloween is specifically being targeted or young people are being targeted for Halloween. And the DEA administrator has been very clear. If we heard anything like that, we would get that out immediately to people. How are we holding these dealers responsible at this point? Again, uh, you know, we have seen different approaches throughout the entire country. Uh, these poisonings uh, in some places are being charged as murders. Uh, it, DEA right now is laser focused on the two cartels, the Sinaloa cartel and the Jalisco cartel, that are responsible for the production and the importation uh, of this deadly substance. We are taking that network approach from top to bottom and bottom to top to defeat them. Okay. Um is there a way to test for fentanyl in your system like we do for meth? I'm not aware of that. No? I'd leave that up to a doctor to, you know. OK. What is the difference between illicit fentanyl and pharmaceutical fentanyl? Is, is there a big distinction between the two? Yeah. Clearly, what we're talking about today is illegally manufactured fentanyl. Uh, there is pharmaceutical grade fentanyl. Uh, and it, again, not a doctor, but I, I've read enough to, to know that it is designed for patients who are literally at the end of life uh, in the worst possible pain. And even at that point, it's, it, I've been told by doctors, it's very difficult to dose. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a substance that these cartels have figured out that they can manufacture using chemicals supplied by chemical supply companies in China. They can mass produce it at, at epic numbers, cheaper and easier than they could any other drug, and they're flooding it into our communities. Yes. Question. Hi. Is it working? It seems like it is. Um, I'm curious, what portion of the fentanyl in the U.S. do we believe comes from the cartels? And, and when did the cartels kind of start to really get involved? That seems like a real turning point in, in all of this. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Uh, again, the two cartels that I mentioned, the Sinaloa cartel and the Jalisco New Generation cartel, or CJNG, we believe are responsible for... Uh, most, if not all, of the fentanyl that we're seeing end up in the United States. Uh, these cartels are ruthless. Uh, they've, they've, men, you know, they've been involved in the manufacturing and, and importation of almost every drug imaginable. But right now, they know that the, the money that they're making mostly uh, is from the production of fentanyl. And they're pressing it into as many different types of pills and powder forms as they can. Yeah, from, from an HSI or Homeland Security Investigations perspective, we have seen, as I mentioned earlier, our seizures of fentanyl increase over the past four or five years and other hard narcotics decreasing specifically at the border. Uh, so yeah, the, the trend is definitely there where uh, due to the unlimited supply of precursor chemicals, uh, how cheap it, how cheaply it's made and, uh, and basically as Paul mentioned in his opening remarks, you know, with the sugar packet, uh, the concealment methods are, are anywhere and it can be concealed anywhere when it comes across the border. Do you have any more questions? Yes.
So, well, let me take the first part of your question first, what, which, which is what, what can you do? And, and you're doing it right now. We need to continue to have as many conversations uh, in all of our communities as we possibly can. We need younger people like you. Um, who you know are that near peer age group with with so many young people because that's who they're going to listen to and you're connecting with them on the platforms that you already mentioned which is which is so important when it when it comes to the second part of your question you know this is the deadliest substance that we've ever seen we don't recommend anybody handle it or, or do anything you know th that would expose themselves to it okay I think um, are there any other questions Social media, okay. So um, we'll take a short break and come back um, in about 10 minutes. Does that work? Okay, great. Thank you everyone. And thanks for your participation. Thank you to the panel. Do you want me to, this is four person thing, because I just sit down after and like hit the, the mic. Yeah. But that, the problem is that we need an extra mic, I think. Four people. Oh, text. Test, test. Like, re
Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, let me, sorry. I, might, I think that might, some of the panelists might be on there. Let me just try to make sure I have that. I was trying to just make my... Give mine. Okay. Yeah, these are. I'm done with. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you. I have a respiratory infection, but I have come on antibiotics and everything, and that's all I have to. I'm popping a hold now. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's fine. It's going around, I guess. It is definitely yeah. going around. Yeah, I have to have a sore throat and. Hi, Amy. I'm Brandy. <laughs> Isn't that awkward when I when I start off with your name? Like, damn. <laughs> she may know me. Yes, I am. I know there's not as many. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm gonna move over here. Let me let me move this. Sorry. Sure. Unfortunately, on crime issues, thank you for all the rest of them. Yeah, very heavily focused on judicial reforms. And one of my messages to them is to close out the Like, okay, that's important. That's fine. But it's not yeah. reducing prison sentences and saying that it's not fine. Is you're not going upstream far. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't reduce crime. Yeah, it, you're in shift and um, You know, there's some good that comes from that. It's the end, but it's not, it's not aimed at preventing crime when we know, we know prevention works just like we tell it. It's 
same thing. You prevent something, and there needs to be a constant reminder. Yeah. People forget. Yeah. You know, people still forget. They're locked their doors. Yeah. People, you know, um, um, key fobs. Yeah. People leave them in their car console. Right, right. Because it's easier. Right. But okay, it's easier for the criminal too. You know, it, 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 you know, it's that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and then as you know, I make a big point of talking about 21st century times like this because. You don't get a handle on the cyber trade and criminal activities and fake products. Um, local law enforcement is going to be overwhelmed with that. It, it, it's that um, fake product. Probably this month will top, top a um, two billion dollar market. You know, it's everything. And, you know, people think. Yeah, okay, I bought a fake Gucci purse for six of them. It's not. They're also manufactured by car companies. And then that's getting, re you know, that money, like I said, they're capital. They're reinvested. It's, it's a business enterprise. Yeah, these are yours, but I, okay. Of course. Okay, we're going to get to the second half of the program. Uh, can I get the panelists to please come to the uh, the table? Thank you. Oh, um, I think we're going to have to share between the three. That's if that's okay. Yeah, I have to sit, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. I'm going to hold that one. Okay. Yeah, just because I can. Yeah. Oh, if that's okay. Right. When I'm sitting down, that's oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I know. If I run, you run. But I, yeah, they're going to have to share the three. That's okay. Okay. 
I think we're okay. okay. So sharing mics. Involving families and community members is key to solving this crisis. Each person joining us today has been on the front lines of battling fentanyl, and we are so happy that you could be here. I'm certain that each will speak their minds, come up with ideas, enlighten this discussion based on their real experience. So um, first, I'd like to introduce Amy Neville. She is the founder of the Alexander Neville Foundation. She's a yoga and fitness instructor, small business owner, president of Alexander Neville Foundation, and mother of two from Laguna Niguel. Alexander, her firstborn, firstborn son, lost his life from a fake prescription pill made of illicit fentanyl purchased via social media. He was 14 with high school and his whole life ahead of him. Alex was in an experimental phase, took a single pill one night and never woke up. Since losing her son, Amy has devoted her time to continuing to raise her daughter and bringing awareness to fentanyl to the general public. Her efforts have brought her in touch with experts in every area of the fentanyl opioid crisis, including DEA officials, prosecutors, Southern California County sheriffs, California state legislators, Rehabilitation counselors, teachers, and young adults like her son, Alex, each interaction informs her efforts and allows her to spread this message. We have, apologies, Dr. Brandy Izquierdo. And one second. She is the executive director of the SAFE Project. Her drive and determination are built on making an impact within behavioral health, promoting long-term recovery and ensuring communities are educated and have the tools necessary to combat the addiction epidemic. Before leading the SAFE project, Brandy worked for Faces and Voices of Recovery as the Director of Advocacy and Outreach. In addition, she served as the Associate Director of Special Populations with Behavioral Health System Baltimore and as the Director of Consumer Affairs for the State of Maryland's Behavioral Health Administration. In these leadership roles, Brandy has led advocacy efforts to expand access to behavioral health services and recovery support services while providing technical assistance both nationally and internationally, empowering others within the recovery movement. Her ability to build relationships and bridge gaps within behavioral health, community services, and criminal justice have been a catalyst for global peer expansion. We have Ramey Kyle, he's commander of the Narcotics and Special Investigations Division of the Metropolitan Police Department here in Washington, DC. He serves as commander of the Narcotics, um, as I said, Special Investigations Division. And as part of that role, he oversees a division that is responsible for the investigation and disruptions of drug narcotics trafficking, firearm trafficking offenses, and prostitution human trafficking offenses in the District of Columbia. Gretchen Peters, who is executive director of the Alliance to Counter Crime Online is here. As the founder, she's an expert in researching and mapping transnational organized crime networks and pinpointing ways to defeat them. She has worked with the US Central Command and US Special Operations Command, as well as multiple con conservation groups. Gretchen has co-chaired an OECD task force on fighting wildlife crime and authored the groundbreaking book seeds of terror about the Taliban's role in the Afghan heroin trade. Thank you for being here. Let you, I'll let you um, start with your, Amy, do you wanna start? Okay. Do you mind moving oh, that sure. one? Yeah, yeah. That works for me. My understanding was that we were going to be asked questions. Okay, we're going straight to questions. <laughs> I mean, I was told to provide an intro, but you did that. So. <laughs> okay. Sure. Yeah, do you have any initial sure. thoughts on it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. Tatiana is the best, you guys. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, you already heard what has brought me here to this to this stage today. Uh, we lost our 14-year-old son, Alexander, in June of 2020. Uh, we always thought we were prepared for that experimental phase. And uh, long story short, um, we were not prepared for 
for what happened in our family. Alex came to us. We knew there was a problem. He came to us. Yes, I've been experimenting with these pills. It had maybe been 10 days at the most. And we reached out for help. They needed to call us back. And that night he died. I don't tell you that as a sob story. I tell you that so you can recognize the urgency in this matter. At the time, people were still talking about, you know, it's grandma's pills being doled out to friends, and that's what we thought we were dealing with. Unfortunately, this has been going on long before Alexander passed away, and this is bigger, you know, than one 14-year-old. This is a, a huge, huge crisis that we're experiencing in our country, and, you know, out of the gate, we were like, what the heck happened in our family? From there, I started meeting with experts on the topic including youth. They are the experts on the social media side of things to figure out what are we missing for you for, and what, how do we help you? You know, you, these teens are having a lived experience that their parents haven't had and we need to tap into that and we need to understand that better as the adults in their lives. And from there, we've developed, you know, education and information that I travel the country and deliver to anyone and everyone that will listen to me. And if you don't want to listen to me, I'm still going to talk to you. It doesn't matter. I will. I'm, I'm, this is my life now, and I think it's incredibly important. And my, my primary focus is that 12 to 17-year-old age group and really getting people to, and families to understand that we, are not, that we are living at a very different time, that we are living at a time where you do not necessarily have to have a traditional drug problem to die from drugs. Um, I am a um, crime uh, researcher and um, a consultant to, to a variety of organizations. And about four years ago now, um, I co-founded the Alliance to Counter Crime Online with another group of researchers. Um, we now have, uh, uh, or with a group of, of crime researchers and, and activists, um, we now have more than 40 members around the world, including uh, Amy uh, and, an, and a few other um, parents that are leading um, these incredible um, uh, campaigns to educate law enforcement, to educate people, to raise awareness among uh, children and teens um, about the dangers happening um, right inside um, the phones that we all carry around in our pockets. Um, we are campaigning to get the laws changed, the governing cyberspace. Um, if somebody posts a picture of um, capsules and says DM me um, for delivery, um, that is currently considered um, protected free speech. If that is posted on Snapchat or Instagram, um, two, two platforms used by a vast majority of um, American teenagers. Um, that, in my opinion, is not a person expressing their First Amendment rights. They are committing a felony. Um, and our laws need to be changed to define the difference between criminal conduct uh, and free expression. Um, that's one of the things we're working on. We're also helping members to um, file civil litigation um, against tech platforms uh, and other entities that um, financial institutions that we believe um, uh, play a role in spreading uh, and amplifying this horrible crisis. Uh, just on that note, I want to talk about very briefly um, the scale of the drug of the fentanyl crisis compared to past. Uh, drug epidemics in this country. Um, at the time of the black tar heroin epidemic in the 1970s, and this was what um, prompted then President Nixon to launch the infamous um, war on drugs, we were losing between three and 5,000 Americans a year to drug-related deaths. Um, the crack cocaine epidemic went up slightly. It was more around four to 5,000 Americans a year. We're now losing over 100,000. We're essentially crashing a plane load of kids into a mountain every single day. Um, and I don't see the response from our government as being com um, uh, comparable to the size of the crisis. I don't see law enforcement informed and advised when they... Uh, um, the story that, that, that these two women told today about the EMT knowing exactly why um, her brother and her son were dead, but they had no idea. Most of the families that I talked to, um, the first time they ever heard of fentanyl was when they found, was, was when the EMTs arrived and their kid was lying dead on the floor of their bedroom or in their bed. Um, that is a disgrace. Uh, there needs to be a 
multi-time, multi-level plus up in the amount of um, public education our government is funding um, on this issue. I wish ONDCP were here today or somebody from the White House. There needs to be a lot more goddamn money put into educating the public about this issue. I would like to see law enforcement start investigating tech platforms like Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram, as to whether the level of activity taking place rises to the level of a RICO violation. I think um, um, Evan Spiegel and Mark Zuckerberg are um, some of the biggest drug distributors in this country right now, and they ought to be held accountable um, for not removing this stuff on their platforms. Those platforms are surveillance tools. They know exactly what everybody is doing, and they are not removing it, and, and um, they're profiting massively um, off of the um, activity that's taking place on these platforms. Um, I, I think that's mostly all I wanted to say. I could go on for many more hours. Thank you. All right, can everybody hear me? I've been told to speak really uh, close to the microphone. So, um, First of all, my name is uh, Ramey Kyle. I'm a uh, commander with the Metropolitan Police Department, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here to speak about such an important topic. Um, I want to echo the sentiments, and I'm sure everybody in the room, and everybody that's, that's watching live, um, and just uh, really thank Jeanette, Ava, and Amy for sharing your story, especially sharing the stories of uh, Devin and uh, Alex. Um, I can tell you that your words were moving, that they were powerful, um, I can't even begin to imagine what your family's been through, what you're going through, what you probably will go through. Uh, I have two small kids of my own, and you know, just seeing this from my perspective and hearing your perspective, this, this issue scares me to death, absolutely scares me to death. Um, I also want to tell you, tell you that I really admire your strength. I could see you guys up there. I knew that was hard. And I want you to know that your strength is what gives us in local law enforcement, especially here in the Metropolitan Police Department, the sense of uh, purpose and sense of determination of really holding those uh, people accountable that are peddling this uh, poison on our streets every single day. Um, I currently command the uh, Violent Crime Suppression Division. Two of the uh, most important duties that I'm charged with is uh, investigating the distribution of illegal drugs here in Washington, D.C., as well as investigating um, fatal overdoses. I can tell you that we do that. Uh, we have a team of detectives that are, are dedicated to that. They go out every day, investigate these cases, speak with the families, speak with uh, witnesses, try to pull evidence, try to try to get video footage, um, get in the phones, get into social media, as I was recently um, uh, suggested. And we do that also here, uh, and I don't, I don't think this is unique in our city, but uh, you know, being in Washington, D.C., we do have some advantages, and uh, we work very, very closely with uh, many of our federal partners. Uh, I can't say enough about the uh, Drug Enforcement Agency. Um, we work every single day with the Washington Field uh, Division to investigate these overdose cases. Uh, the United States Attorney's Office here in Washington, D.C. Um, we're also part of the, uh, what's called the Violent Crime Impact Team. It's actually a team that uh, includes agents from the DEA, the FBI, the ATF, uh, the U.S. Marshals, and the United States Attorney's Office, and we're able to leverage the resources from those uh, federal agencies that help us in our local investigations. And it's uh, it's paid in, in dividends uh, tenfold. Um, I, again, I just want to say I'm really, uh, I'm really excited to be here. I'm really excited to discuss this issue, and I really hope that we make some progress here today. And uh, you know, we push this uh, this issue forward. Thank you. Hi, hi everyone. My name is Brandy Skierdo. I am the executive director of Safe Project, which stands for Stop the Addiction Fatality Epidemic. I think I'm here for various reasons. One, you know, my heart goes to you um, and to you as well and to every other family member who has lost someone uh, to fentanyl. And it's, it's, it's a devastating, we're in a devastating situation and it's a crisis, it's an epidemic and something needs to be done about it. I think one of the viewpoints that I perhaps bring to the table is I am a person in recovery and I have to honestly and openly admit that a lot of times when I speak with family members, there's a level of survivor's remorse that goes along with that. Um, but it's also my duty to make sure that I get the message out um, because I was, I was granted that opportunity to do that. Um, I too have children of my own, one right now, 15, I actually have four. That's a long story. Um, <laughs> but I have four, one right now who is 15 and another who's 20 who's still in the house. And then I have my 24 and 28 year old. And every single day that they go outside of that door, the fear 
for them is unbelievable, and I'm hoping to bring some of the solutions. I talk quite a bit about a harm reduction approach because the education system does need to be involved. I can tell you firsthand as a person in recovery, we are turned away from the education system, and a lot of that is because of public enemy number one, and that's stigma and discriminatory practices. And the, the reality is we as, an, as a community need to come together with people in recovery. We have over 23 million Americans in recovery. And I can tell you firsthand, working with the educational system, that there is never a safe space for my children to talk about recovery. And we know that those peers are the ones that are getting that information out to their friends and family and, and, and all of that in those school systems. So together, if we work collectively, we can do something to make a difference. Um, one person, one family at a time. And I'm hoping that some of these questions will, will bring that solutions-focused approach. Here's a question from a parent. Can you speak to the impact of social media? I think this would be a good one for Gretchen, right? Um, on this crisis, particularly in terms of the access that it's given to children. Um, is this on? Yes, I mean, I think that um, there's, a, there's a toxic mix going on today where um, kids spend hours and hours a day um, on their phone and their parents are effectively, um, kids spend hours and hours a day um, on social media platforms and their parents are basically blind to it. We, most of us, including myself, I have two teenage daughters, um, I have no idea what they're doing most of the time that they're on social media. Um, I have no idea who all they're talking to um, um, and what experiences they're having, what they're learning. Um, but they come home all the time with um, ideas of things that they want to do or cook or um, the way they want to wear their, you know, they're being influenced by what they're learning. And we have, we are, we are in new territory here because we don't know what they're seeing. Um, the, um, Algorithms within social media are connecting people um, with each other, and this is not just limited to the drug space. We see this uh, in wildlife crime. We see this in human trafficking. We see it in the spread of child sex abuse content. Um, all of these um, crime sectors are growing at exponential rates, it's sort of like the, the example I gave you of uh, the number of drug-related deaths that are happening now in the United States. Uh, and I will not say drug overdoses. These are drug-related deaths. Many of them are people that were, th these were not like Jim Belushi type nights where they were doing loads and loads of drugs. Many of these people are dying from half a pill. Um, these, are, these people are being poisoned. Anybody would die from these. They're not overdosing. Uh, and that's part of this toxic combination, that there is a lack of information um, that these pills are out there. In fact, studies show that Gen Z kids know that street drugs like heroin and cocaine are dangerous. And they're buying pills online because they think they're getting a safe alternative. They think they're getting a pill that came out of Walgreens or CVS or Rite Aid. Um, and it's that critical issue uh, and, the, and the fact that parents think, oh, well, my kid's not a junkie. This isn't going to happen to us. Um, that's the problem. Additionally, there's this, the, the stigma attached to, um, to uh, drug use and drug um, uh, substance abuse disorder. We're not treating it um, like the mental health crisis that it is. 86% uh, of teenagers today feel overwhelmed. Uh, we have a mental health crisis in this country that has been exacerbated by social media use and then by the pandemic. Uh, and we're not responding to that appropriately either. So there's just this confluence of things that are, are putting our kids at risk in a way um, that that previous generations um, just did not face. Um, and we really need to be taking this on as a national emergency with a lot more um, money, frankly, and resources, uh, and uh, an approach that is not just limited to the DEA and Homeland Security, but also our Treasury Department, uh, our Education Department, um, our um, healthcare system. Uh, this needs to be a whole of government and, in fact, whole of society approach to, to um, get these kids out of danger. Thanks. Yes. Here. Died from uh, these overdoses. Are you tracking it worldwide? Because I'm sure it's just not here in the United States, Europe, South America, you know, uh, where the fentanyl is 
must be appearing, I would think of appearing worldwide, and, and maybe start calling this thing a pandemic and not uh, an epidemic, because it really, I think it's a global problem. And maybe working with other countries and other law enforcement agencies, Europol, Interpol, and others around the world. But I just wonder what your thoughts are as a researcher. Are you tracking a global, a global, um, uh, you know? Uh, uh. So social media algorithms are spreading um, drug use and connecting drug drug uh, users and drug sellers uh, at astronomical rates around the world. However, the fentanyl crisis is really pretty much focused in the United States, uh, Canada, um, Australia is having a rising problem. Um, there's other countries battling other drug issues. You've got, you see a lot of stuff like uh, Captagon and um, I forget what some of the other ones are in Africa. Um, uh, South Asia has its own heroin problem, thanks largely to uh, Afghanistan. Uh, Russia battles terrible problems with, with heroin addiction. Um, but the, the fentanyl issue um, is really, um, fentanyl is, is pouring into the United States. And I also think we need to look at the national security implications of that. The chemicals are all coming out of China. Um, they are connected, uh, some of the chemical companies are connected to um, uh, politically associated people within the Chinese government. We, I don't see a lot of conversations about that. We need to be, we, uh, there needs to, we need to be following the money around the fentanyl trade uh, much more closely and exposing what we're finding. In addition, um, a lot of the money is being laundered in the United States at the ground level. The place that's consuming the drugs is where the first placement of money takes place. And a lot of that placement is taking place not actually in cryptocurrency, but again, in very regular um, cash app and other um, uh, social media based platforms for moving money. We need to be looking at that. Um, we need to be looking at all the real estate that's being purchased uh, across the United States with uh, fentanyl profits. Uh, it, it, the money isn't all leaving the United States. A lot of it gets laundered here and stays here, um, and we need to be chasing it. Um, drug dealers will get out of the drug business if they start losing money. Okay, that's from my experience. That. So w when it comes to the other countries too, I've had multiple meetings, international meetings with multiple countries over the last year, and they want to know what I know because they want to get out ahead of it. They see it starting to trickle in and they want to be uh, proactive rather than reactive. Can, can I piggyback? Gretchen, I really appreciate the mental health piece of it and I'll bring the behavioral health lens hopefully, hopefully to perspective. Um, you know, being a person in long-term recovery, I will talk a little bit about my active addiction. I didn't come out of the gate wanting to have a substance use disorder or having, or, or wanting to go down that route. route. I'm sorry, I'm battling an alt cold, so my voice goes in and out. So I want to say that first and foremost. Um, so I started off in that exploratory piece of it and then became the Jim, or Jim Belushi. Right? It didn't start off that way, so I was hit and blindsided by my, my disease of addiction. I, will, I do want to say that. So we need to work for everyone in the community and everyone nationally and internationally who is battling substance use disorder, mental health challenges, all of that. The other thing that I want to say is that our systems, not only from a national security perspective, may be broken, but in our behavioral health systems, they're broken, completely broken. We skate around the mental health crisis. We keep talking about being reactive rather than proactive. We need to go upstream and find out why people are actually falling in, in, in the beginning. Amy, you, you talked about that quickly uh, about your son reaching out for help and needing access to services. We don't have on-demand treatment. There is a small amount of time for someone who's asking for help, begging for help, and that's about 10 minutes. If I don't get that individual into treatment within 10 minutes, I, I, the, the engagement is gone. So we need to take a look at our behavioral health system and the integration of that behavioral health system, specifically around mental health. When we talk about youth and young adults, we don't have enough child psychiatrists or, psychiatr or psychologists out there to field these issues. School systems are strapped right now. Prison systems are strapped. You may have 10,000 individuals behind a prison system and it gets them into any type of behavioral health. You may have 300 out of those 10,000 that can get into that health system. So we need to take a look at our systems and how to fully integrate them, get on-demand treatment, and make sure that we make this a priority from youth on up. Otherwise, we're fighting an uphill battle, and we need to start going upstream and figuring out 
why they're falling in. Thank you for that. Are there any other questions in the audience? Yes, Paul. Are there platforms that are doing a better job than others? Or is it more that some platforms are designed to be more conducive to drug dealers and other illicit activities? I know Amy wants to jump in here. Um, some, some platforms are definitely more conducive <clears throat> to drug dealers than others. Um, uh, platforms that um, have encryption technology, for example, uh, uh, Dealers will often, and this is not just limited to drugs, This we see this across all crime sectors. Uh, a, dealers have to advertise, right? So, that, so often they will have a posting somewhere, say on TikTok or on uh, Instagram or Facebook, um, but then they will try and increasingly we'll see them move. If, if somebody chats with them or says how much or clicks that they like the picture, they will get moved onto another uh, encrypted chat platform. So it becomes hard to follow them. It's not, it's, um, it's not as open as it was a few years ago. Um, the platforms, I'm, I'm actually doing, a, currently doing an um, uh, undercover, we do a number of undercover studies where we pose as, as young kids and we go on and try and buy drugs. Um, I was still able to connect with drug dealers within 24 hours of setting up my last um, profile as a 14-year-old boy um, on Snapchat and Instagram. So it, it, these are the most popular platforms with American teens. So those platforms, re they really do have a problem, and they still have a problem. They're doing more than they were a year or two ago, um, but, they, but they're not, they're, they're still, it's still way too easy um, to, to communicate with, with drug dealers uh, and to locate them very quickly. Um, again, these platforms are surveillance tools. We are living in an age of surveillance capitalism where these platforms, they're free to us to use because they are mining us for our data. They know everything about us. They know where your, that your phone is following you around. They know who your friends are. They know what you're doing. A person who is dealing drugs on Snapchat or Instagram has a very different profile and pattern of activity than say, uh, you know, grandmother who's sharing pictures of her grandkids. Um, the platforms have the capacity to look for those patterns of activity and drill down and see who are the dealers and hand that information over law enforcement. They're not legally obligated to do so right now, and that is one of the problems with our legal system right now. Um, our laws treat anything that happens in cyberspace as protected free speech. We can define the difference between selling drugs online, selling uh, child sex abuse content, um, uh, trafficking uh, in people. We can define the difference between that and, and protected free speech. Uh, that's literally just a question of our Congress um, putting aside their partisan differences and defining those, uh, those issues better than they do now. This question is for Amy. When talking to communities impacted by fentanyl, what are you seeing in terms of reception and barriers to receiving the message? So the first thing that usually, the first reaction I usually get is, why are we not talking about this? And so my response to that is usually, okay, well, we're talking about it right now. Now it's your job to go talk about it to at least 10 people. Uh, so people are typically shocked. Um, they feel very let down. Uh, and they want answers. You know, they want to protect their families. And the biggest reaction I get is, you know, when I first started this work, the response I got from parents when I t start talking with like, oh, we don't have to worry about that. We don't have a drug problem in our house. My kid would never do that. So really breaking it down to parents, how yes, your kid would could really do this and giving them those very real examples of like the football player who got hurt and thought he was getting something for pain. Catherine who got, had a tooth pulled and mom couldn't afford the pain medication and she put it out that she needed something and somebody showed up with that and now she's gone. You know, we're not just looking at these drugs. Kids aren't just looking at these drugs to necessarily get high. They're looking to treat real pain. They think they're getting legitimate prescriptions. And those things start to get parents to start thinking, okay, that can happen in my household. And also the big change in the language, instead of saying overdose and saying poisoning, parents can relate to that. I mean, from the second you're pregnant, you are childproofing your house so your kid can't get into something to be poisoned or to be hurt. And so switching that language, just that little change in words, people are like, oh wait, 
my kid might not overdose, but my kid could be poisoned. And it makes it much more relatable and really opens people up to the idea and kind of takes down that, helps take down that stigma that we're dealing with. Got it. Um, this question is for Ramey. This is, what role does Narcon play in addressing this crisis? Did I say that correctly? Narcom? Uh, Narcan. Narcan. Narcam, sorry. What role does Narcam play in addressing this crisis, and what can communities-based organizations, how can they help the police with this? So um, Narcan plays a huge role in this. Um, if, if you don't know, Narcan is a, uh, it's actually a brand name of a medication that can be administered um, quite easily to somebody that's uh, overdosing from a, a opioid, including fentanyl. Um, on our police department, every officer carries uh, fentanyl. Uh, we're all trained on, on doing it. We've done it, uh, I believe, the last stat I had since, since, we, since its inception, I think 1,900 uh, times here in the District of Columbia. And um, uh, here in D.C., our D.C. government, uh, you can get it for free. So there's uh, many sites that you can go to, to pick it up for free. I think they'll, if you call them, they'll even mail it to your house if, if you uh, need, need be. If anybody needs the information, uh, they can go to this, uh, the website. It's uh, livelong.dc.gov. Um, and the other thing that uh, I've been trying to stress in all of our uh, outreach events, so here, here in Washington, D.C., we, we definitely have the problem with the, the, the pills and, you know, these, uh, these fake oxys, fake uh, Xanax is what we see a lot. Or, but what we really see here is um, fentanyl being added to everyday drugs. So we, we see it added to marijuana. We see it added to um, crack cocaine. We've seen it added to uh, mollies or MDMA. We've seen it added to, to you name it, it's, it's added to it. And through our investigations and through talking to um, people in, in some of our cases, uh, the reason they do it is because it, uh, once a drug user has uh, fentanyl in their system, they don't ever want anything else. So it's, it's been equated to what I've heard is uh, adding hot sauce to it or adding rocket fuel to it. So if you're, a, if you're a crack cocaine user and all of a sudden you get a hit that has fentanyl on it, you're going to go back to that dealer and you, wanna, you want that product. You no longer want the product you may have been using for three, five, ten years. And it... it, it it presents a problem, and the problem is, is you may have been a, a, a lifelong cocaine user, lifelong marijuana user, and now all of a sudden you're suffering from an overdose, and you don't know what it is. So I know if you've if you've been using opioids or heroin, you, you kind of know the symptoms. You know, hey, I probably should have a Narcan in the house. I should probably have it in my car. Uh, your friends probably carry it. Maybe even your family members carry it. But if you're, you know, a lifelong user of marijuana or MDMA, you're not thinking that at all. And then you're getting surprised just as the person that took the fake Oxy or the, the person that uh, uh, took the fake Xanax. So uh, needless to say, going back to the, the, uh, the question, Narcan is huge. I, I, I actually, when we go out to uh, outreach events, uh, I encourage everybody to have it because you just, you just never know. We tell our police officers, like, uh, when you're on the street and you come across an overdose, yeah, of course you're going to use it, but you also need to be thinking about using that on your fellow officer. They may get exposed to it. And, um, and we're also, we also train them to look, at, look for the signs even when heroin or opioids isn't suspected. So this is a huge piece, and it's, it saves lives, and I, I encourage everyone to have it just in case. I have a question. So in, in D.C., on average, how many Narcans are you using to revive somebody? So our, I just have the stats for our, for our police department, okay. and it, it ranges um, anywhere from five a week to 15 a week. So, I mean, per person. So I know in Arizona, it takes almost two to revive somebody. Oh, I, I don't know the exact number that they get, that just the officers get. Yeah, but they, I, they, are, they are equipped with it, and we use it every single day. My point is, I guess, if you're going to have Narcan, make sure you have multiples on hand. Good point. Yes. We have a question. Actually, we have a few questions. There are two. Yep. Hi, um, I had a quick question for um, Gretchen Peters. You mentioned um, civil lawsuits against some tech platforms. I was curious if you could talk a little bit more about that, like what cases have been filed, if, if any, so far, and, and, and what, how that's kind of uh, playing out in court. Sure. Um, so our organization, the Alliance to Counter Crime Online, has filed a multi-chapter um, civil suit against um, Facebook. Um, not limited to um, the amount of drugs that, that sell across Facebook platforms, uh, and certainly not limited to, to fentanyl. There's a lot of drugs that sell, um, a lot of fake uh, pharmaceuticals that, that sell on Facebook platforms. Um, but we're, <clears throat> anyway, we filed a, a multi-chapter complaint to the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, I hope they pay attention to it. Um, 
the, the um, Facebook platforms are a cesspit of illicit activity, uh, ranging from child sex abuse content to um, wildlife crime, animal abuse, uh, human abuse, like abusing other people, snuff films, that kind of thing. Um, uh, the illegal antiquities trade, terror financing. Um, Hezbollah is so uh, dependent on using Facebook to raise money that they've actually, their, uh, their um, fundraising arm, or sorry, their um, social media arm, which calls itself the Electronic Jihad, has actually integrated the Facebook logo into the Hezbollah logo, just to give you an example. Um, so we've, we've been providing evidence to the Securities and Exchange Commission that a public uh, company should not be profiting to the extent that Facebook is off of um, uh, illicit activity happening on its platforms. Um, any brick and mortar company has what's known under um, tort law as a duty of care to remove illicit activities from its premises. Uh, a nightclub will get shut down if there's a lot of drug dealing taken, taking place on their platform. A hotel will get shut down if um, uh, pedophilia or child prostitution or other or regular prostitution is taking place um, on their premises. However, for some bizarre reason, um, our society has decided to accept the astounding amount of illicit activity that is taking place on these um, online premises, um, and we're not holding these platforms account for uh, to account for not removing that. We think that the laws should change, giving the platforms a duty of care, the same duty of care that our um, uh, brick and mortar companies um, have to abide by. Section 230 of the Communications uh, Act has essentially been a gigantic subsidy to our tech industry, uh, allowing them to essentially move fast and break things. I think enough things have been broken now that we can um, change those laws uh, and uh, bring our laws into, um, into the 21st century. Um, I feel like I haven't answered your question. Oh, I know, other lawsuits. We, we have, one of our members is suing YouTube um, over animal abuse. Uh, Amy and a number of parents who are also members are suing Snapchat. Um, we've, um, we're also, uh, we have other members that are building a, 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 an other civil lawsuits, um, but we're, we're, essentially our organization exists because nobody else is doing this. None of us want to be doing this. I actually have a full-time job. Um, I, you know, kind of like you guys, we, we're doing this because we saw this problem exploding and we saw a lack of action. Uh, and we came together as essentially crime activists, anti-crime activists and, and crime researchers, um, realizing that nobody else was, was um, studying this issue uh, and taking a stand on this issue. Um, and so we stepped up, reluctantly stepped into the void. Uh, and here we are four, four or five years later. Can I, can I talk just quickly about lulls? When we're talking about that, there are also counter aspects that we need to take a look at in terms of behavioral health. Um, just prime example, my son's laying on the couch, 15 years old. This is during the pandemic. Mom, I, need, I think I need Adderall. You know, he, we've had this conversation over and over. As a person in recovery, we're pretty, uh, not even pretty, like extremely open about what's happening out there. And of course, you know, I go on high alert. That's the first thing I do. And um, from there, I said, okay, I need to up my game. And that game is making sure that my 15-year-old is armed with Narcan, armed with fentanyl testing strips, understands how to identify an overdose and how to respond to an overdose. Unfortunately, fentanyl testing strips are illegal in certain areas or throughout states for drug uh, fact checking uh, or drug checking um, um, paraphernalia, so to speak. Uh, my 15 year old, I cannot legally provide him Narcan. So if we're taking a look at tools and solutions, um, when my son says, I see this on my phone that I want Adderall and I know that I'm going down that road, I don't have the means based on law and legislation to legally provide him the tools that he needs to survive. That's a problem. That's a problem in this United States that we can actually fix, and yet we still don't. So while we're doing things on a national scale, there also needs to be something on a community scale that I can arm my 15-year-old legally to walk down the street with Narcan and fentanyl testing strips and be prepared and be ready to go. One of the other things that I also do is BOLO. You know what that is, right? The BOLO. For us, be on the lookout for this street drug. And I tell him what's happening. He says, Mom, this is coming all the way from California. I said, well, it's coming our way. So you need to spread that word. And I utilize him as that first responder 
within those school systems, but he also has the tools that if someone does overdose in the park, he's not feeling helpless that he can't help. So it's really important for us to take a look at our legislations, or our legislation and regulation. And then finally, I'll stop with this. There are a lot of laws coming out there in terms of fentanyl and, and how much you can have on, in possession, which is overriding some of our Good Samaritan laws. So, you know, we've worked really hard in our Good Samaritan laws to ensure that if someone is overdosing, that another person can revive that person with Narcan without being charged. So we really need to take a look at what's happening and the nuances associated with all of these laws, because what we're going to do is we're going to end up pulling people back in and not wanting to save lives. And that's the ultimate goal to save lives. So I just wanted to put that out there from our, our behavior health perspective. Uh, I do have a question, but I first want to say thank you so much for all of this information. I think, you know, I hope that my generation and a lot more people can be ed educated with this straightforward information um, because we're not right now and it's, it's really frustrating. Uh, but Rami, I had a question for you uh, just because my mom and I talked about our story and someone, w my brother was talking to a dealer on Instagram and as terrible as I know those platforms are, we did have the information and no one went after that. So I'm wondering if you guys have a new uh, approach to that or if you guys are following up with these dealers that are on the social media apps yeah absolutely um and i could tell you um when you guys were speaking up there that was actually absolutely heartbreaking and yeah. i hope that there's no case in the district of columbia that 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 happens and we work very hard to ensure that doesn't happen uh, we investigate uh all the overdose deaths that happen here in the district of columbia and we do it a, a multiple approach so um Sometimes, sometimes there's evidence from a cell phone, so maybe they, they've contacted the dealer, like obviously in Devin's case, and we can follow up through that. We can use our federal partners to um, get into the phone and to, you know, to see all that stuff. Um, however, here in the District of Columbia, uh, most of ours is actually hand-to-hand -hand street sales, so we don't have that. Now, we have seen some of the Instagram stuff. We have seen people um, post for sale um, pills, um, other prescription medication, marijuana, uh, you name it on, on Instagram, and, and we do actively pursue those. Um, now, we, we do it a different route than, uh, you know, going after the social me media platform. And I, I really appreciate everything that you guys are doing in that, uh, that realm. That, that, is very, that would be very beneficial to us if we could have a positive outcome with that. But um, we usually reach out to them in an undercover capacity, and we, we try to buy drugs from them. And, uh, you know, we arrest them when they show up to sell us some drugs. So that's something that we definitely do, and we, we do it every single day. Um, and, you know, the, the Internet has changed, as everybody knows, it's changed uh, every, everything that we do. It's changed how we, um, how we bank, how we shop for food. Um, I actually bought a car online, you know, through Carvana. Who, who could have thought of that, like, 20 years? But that, that, that's, that's, that spreads to this, too. You know, everybody's, whatever we were doing before, they're doing it on the Internet. They're selling guns on the, on, the, on the Internet. They're selling drugs on the Internet. And it is a huge tool. And any law enforcement uh, agency out there that isn't um, exploiting that, I don't think they're doing their uh, due diligence. Over here. Thank you. Um, I actually have two questions for you. Apologies in advance. The first one is since since marijuana is legal in D.C., um, are those test strips for fentanyl available and legal in D.C. to have to test? And are they effective for people who are using marijuana? And my other question is, as far as the dealers go, we've talked about the cartels, but how often do the dealers in D.C. know what they're dealing? Do they know that what they have has fentanyl in it? So those, those are all good questions. I'm, I'm glad you brought those up. So um, test strips are legal in D.C. Um, you can go to that website I, I, I gave earlier, uh, livelong.dc.gov. You can get them. Uh, from my understanding, they're, they're effective. They work, uh, or else we wouldn't give them out. Uh, you know, the government through the uh, Department of Behavioral Health wouldn't give them out. Um, and as far as, the, as far as the dealers, I can't say for every dealer, but I, I can tell you many of the cases that we've investigated. Um, one in particular happened uh, earlier this year in um, the southwest uh, part of our, our city. Uh, there was an individual that was selling crack cocaine, been selling crack cocaine probably for a while. Um, his customers started complaining that, that he had a weak product. So what did he do? He went, he, put, he got the rocket fuel, and he added it to it. And next thing you know, we had 10, uh, 10 people that lost their life. And um, so that's, that's the trend that I see. I, I, don't, I don't see the trend of uh, people not knowing what they're selling. Now, um, I know I, there were some other experts up there earlier that, you know, about the mixture and uh, like how much gets in a pill. I'm sure that happens every single day. But... Um, in my cases, when they're adding it to other drugs, they absolutely know what they're doing. They do it uh, for a reason, and that's because they, they want a loyal customer base. They know that if they put that in there, those individuals are coming back to them for that same product. 
This question is for Brandy. You mentioned going ahead rather than discussing reactive and proactive and living in the solution. What are some of the solutions? I mean, well, I think there are a multitude of solutions. Um, un unfortunately, or fortunately, they have to work in tandem, right? It, it's not just one solution will be this quick fix. I think that obviously um, we talked a little bit earlier about the educational system. I remember uh, Paul specifically spoke about HIV and, and, and that epidemic. You know, it's really important for us to take a look at the lessons learned of other things that have happened within our nation. So having an actual education system that will embrace us, quite often they'll say, yes, we are embracing this. We are providing this information. High school is too late. I can tell you I started using it at the age of 11. If you talk to most people in recovery, they started in that time bracket or, or before eight, the age of 18. So we need to have these conversations, these real, raw, honest, and candid conversations. And it can't be one and done in terms of education and just checking that box. I think another one is also creating safe space inside those school systems for children of people in recovery because there needs to be a safe space for those individuals who are struggling with mental health or substance use, either in the family, because we know it's a genetic disease as well, and happens from all different areas. Um, also having at-home disposal bags, if you are bringing a prescription home, like gram they're not grandma's pills anymore, but I do have a grandma in my house who's still prescribed opioids um, for a lot of her ailments, and I make sure that they're at, at home disposal bags to destroy that medication. Uh, right then and there, so I don't have to necessarily go to a take back in April or, or October, um, but I can utilize that, that um, uh, avenue as well. I also think on-demand access to treatment. We have the 988 number that was just launched in terms of mental health and substance use, but are the systems ready for that? We need to really ask ourselves that question. When I have an individual who's saying, Brandy, I need help, I need to make sure that I can access that treatment immediately. I need to make sure that there are mental health and substance use counselors inside those school systems. And I also need to make sure that we look at different aspects in terms of individuals in school systems who are involved in disciplinary action. What's happening over there? Why We need to unpack all of this and again, go upstream and really figure out what the, the prime issues and concerns are. I struggle tremendously with de depression and anxiety and that doesn't go away. Just because the substance use, use is, is kind of filtered right now and, and I'm doing well, that doesn't mean my mental health side of things has not gone away and I have to be vigilant on a consistent basis. So it's important for us to have these tools. And finally, I think love, compassion, and support for one another, whether it's a family member who lost someone or a person who perhaps got out of that depth of despair, we need to start working together collectively and really making a difference as, as, as partners and collaborators, law enforcement in every aspect. So there's so many different complex solutions, um, but we have the capability of doing this. It's just a matter of working together. And I think like you had mentioned, this is the start. Thank you. Tara had to head over to uh, Capitol Hill for another meeting. So I'm gonna, we've got one last question. How can families and communities get involved in this issue? Well, I will also remind people to visit our websites, ncpc.org and livesproject.org, and we will continue to have information, ways to stay involved, and I'm sure our panel has lots of ideas. So as far as families and communities getting involved, as parents, you've got to show up at those community events, the community town halls. You know, I mentioned people say, oh, we haven't heard about this, but you know what? I know your school in the last six months has had two events. So if you haven't heard about it, it's because you didn't show up to those events. So get out there and learn about it. Go to my website. You can learn a lot there. Uh, reach out to me. I will have those individual conversations if you're interested in, in doing something in your community. Again, tons of ideas here. Uh, I meet with families and actually community coalitions all the time and talk to them about how we, they can get something started in their community. I'll be doing something in Colorado at the fam DEA Family Summit, talking to the families there about how to get involved and get their communities going. So I am here to help you and your community. In fact, I'm here right now, which means my husband had to fill in for me on a community coalition meeting that was showing our DOA film and uh, discussing that particular community. So it can be done. Uh, you have to be patient. 
I will tell you, it, it took a, a, quite a few tries to even get into Alexander's own school district, but I'm there now, and I get requests all the time to travel the country. So I would much rather take that state and turn it over to you and give you the tools for you to do those things. So please, please, please reach out to me. I'm here. Um, and then also, we need to just understand, we keep talking about the mental health crisis, and, you know, if you go back and you look at Snapchat's report they put out in J July about what they're doing to help combat the U.S. fentanyl crisis, as you read through that, you're going to get to a paragraph that says, well, teens are using drugs because mental health issues are on the rise, period. There's no acknowledgement of the rise of social media and mental health issues in our teens and how they are working together. So as parents, we need to understand that social media is causing us some big, big disruptions in our kids' lives. And I know we don't want to you know, take it away from them. I, I, I totally understand that. I'm not recommending that you do that, but I am recommending that you ask them, you know, you're listening to us today. What do you ask your kid? What do you already know about drugs on Snapchat? And you know what? They might, everything, the way they answer that question is going to tell you everything you need to know. Uh, and if they don't know anything about drugs, great. Wonderful. But I will tell you that I've had multiple times parents reach out to me afterwards. You know, I asked my kid the question. They didn't know anything about drugs. But guess what? This pervert's been sending them naked pictures. And they just think it's normal because it's the Internet. Or they're being extremely bullied, but it's the Internet. And they don't think there's anything they can do about it or it's social media. So have those conversations. You're going to learn something about your kid. Um, I just want to start by saying uh, Amy Neville is a force of nature and um, the amount that she has learned and continues to give back uh, to her and other communities on this is just astounding and I'm really proud to have her as a, a member of my organization. Um, uh, what I think people can do who are paying attention or who are watching this today is um, write to your uh, members of Congress and your senators uh, and tell them to take an interest in this. Um, there is um, uh, there is widespread support across the political aisle um, to deal with this crisis, um, and we need to come together as a nation to um, to, to to do just that. Um, and I, and I, in that, I mean um, both responding to the um, fentanyl epidemic, but also responding to the many problems that are caused um, by uh, social media. Um, there is widespread support for changing the laws uh, governing the internet, um, but organizations like mine, I, I have my, my, the Alliance to Counter Crime Online functions um, on less money than Facebook alone spends every week um, lobbying members of Congress. Um, our budget is tiny compared to, um, we're up against big crime and big tech, uh, two of the most formidable and wealthy um, adversaries that I can possibly imagine. Um, and we can change this. Um, the Europeans, the Brits, the Aussies, and the Canadians are much further along at reforming their laws governing cyberspace, and we need to get, um, we need to get our act in order because these companies are, are American companies. Um, we're the ones that created the internet. We damn well better learn how to regulate it. Thank you. I'm not sure uh, how much more to add to that. I know it's been said multiple times, uh, conversations, conversations, conversations. But um, I think when we do have these conversations, we have to stress how serious this, uh, this issue is. Um, there's uh, people dying. There's a lot of people dying. And good, good people. I mean, Everybody that died, they had a family, they had, they had best friends, they had dreams that are they're never going to be realized again. And I think we have to recognize that. And um, no matter what your station in life is, no matter what your job is, no matter where you work at, whether you're in law enforcement, take it seriously. Don't drop the ball. If you're in the Department of the, uh, Behavioral Health World or Mental Health World, take it seriously. Don't just uh, you know issue out the, uh, the talking points. If you work for Facebook or you work for Instagram, take it seriously. Maybe it isn't free speech. You know, uh, wherever you're at, if you're in the education system, take it seriously. Allow this outreach in. Allow this message to go forward. And I think if each and every one of us do that in every, you know, station of our life, and we can all kind of reach a different person from a different perspective and tackle this from a different perspective, I think we might have a chance. And I think I'll, I'll just say, and I, I can't add too much more other than the fact that bring people to the to, that are in recovery to the table, understand our stories, what happened to us, we did start off um, in that exploratory phase and, and really just not, not siloing us of good people, users, non-users. We are all in this together. And it's really important for us to understand that 
and the more you hear our stories, because I can tell you, um, mine is not, mine might be bright and shiny now. It definitely wasn't that way um, when I was in the depths of despair and even before that. So asking people, you know, what happened to you um, and really finding the root cause uh, is really important in having those conversations and educating and taking a look at our, our behavioral health um, workforce and behavioral health systems and start fixing them. Well, I thank you. I thank everyone, uh, both who joined us in person and um, uh, uh, through the live stream and the many more who will continue to join the effort. Today we took a first step. It's an important step, but we have to remember it was only the first step. We've got to take the second, third, and onward in what will be likely a 10,000-mile journey. Um, we have a long way to go, but I believe, hearing what I heard today, we have the energy, the drive, the willpower to do more. So thank you, everyone, again. I uh, One housekeeping note, our panelists uh, and others, uh, McGruff has joined us. We want to get some group shots and some other things. And uh, I thank you again for your time, your energy, and all that everybody will give to this issue moving forward. Thank you so much.